He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Tēnā koutou, ko William Ray ahau. Hi there, I'm William Ray. No mai ki te hipi pango. Welcome to Black Sheep. This is the second in a two-part series on George Grey, the two-time governor of Aotearoa who led this country through most of the New Zealand wars in the 1840s, 50s and 60s. December 1853. George Grey watched from the rail of his ship as Auckland Harbour slowly vanished behind him. Over the past eight years as governor, he'd grown to love this country, and at least parts of it had loved him back. When it was announced he was leaving, the local newspapers had overflowed with tributes from settlers. This one was published in the New Zealander just before he set sail. When Sir George Grey arrived, he found New Zealand in a state of ruthless and ruinous warfare. He is about to quit it not merely in a condition of profound peace, but in one of immediate and hourly increasing prosperity, and with every prospect of a rapid and unexampled progress in all that is dear and desirable to the most ambitious and enterprising nations. And it wasn't just Pākehā who was sad to see him go. Grey smiled as he thought about the speech the Ngāti Kereru chief, Wurimu Maihi Te Rangi Kāheke, had given at his final farewell ceremony. The speech was delivered in Te Reo, which Grey spoke fluently, but it was later translated and published in a local newspaper. When you came, O oh Governor Grey, it was like the shock of an earthquake. Your fame rose to the centre of the island, and extended to the waves on the ocean's shore. Your efforts on behalf of God's cause are the establishments of schools, the erection of houses of prayer. These are the things you did in regard to the body, encouraged industry in the cultivation of the soil, pointed out the means of acquiring property, and raised the island to its present state of prosperity. If this had been the end of Grey's relationship with Māori and Aotearoa, he'd probably be remembered more fondly. But eight years later, in 1861, Grey would return for a second governorship. He'd launch the largest colonial war in New Zealand history and follow it up with a brutal policy of land confiscation, which left many Māori landless for generations. He would launch this war against the people of Waikato, some of his strongest supporters who helped defend Pākehā in Auckland during the Northern War. For Waikato Tainui historian Rahui Papa, this radical shift in George Grey's character and policy is hard to understand. He was a progressive uh, advocate for Indigenous rights in his early writings and uh, things like that. And then he went on to a total, um, a total swing uh, to the other side, uh, especially as it related to mana motuhake in Māori. Um, who knows what life experiences he had once he left New Zealand and came back. The eight years between Grey leaving New Zealand in 1853 and when he returned in 1861 were a turning point in his life. So for the first part of this episode, we're taking a closer look at those years. By the time he left New Zealand, Grey had a lot of fans in the British colonial office. So they sent him to another trouble spot, Cape Colony, South Africa. At this point, there was no single South African state. There were several colonial settlements from different parts of Europe and several indigenous African nations. One of the most powerful was the Corsa, and they were 70 years into what's sometimes called Africa's Hundred Year War, a series of vicious conflicts with colonial powers. Here's Professor Jeff Perez, a historian at Fort Hare University in Eastern Cape. So George Grey arrived in South Africa in 1854, uh, just after two terrible frontier wars. Five of the previous eight years had been spent in very heavy fighting, uh, and it had uh, 
ended up in a stalemate. The colonists couldn't defeat the indigenes, and the indigenes couldn't drive out the colonists. The indigenes, of course, being the Kosa people. The colonial office really didn't know what to do. And Gray was a man who promised to to square the, the vicious circle, turn the contradictions uh, into actually advantages. Gray's plan for South Africa was basically the same as he'd had for New Zealand and South Australia, assimilate the indigenous people into British society. I wonder if I could read you an extract from his opening speech to the, the Cape Parliament. Sure. If we leave the natives beyond our border, ignorant barbarians, shut out from all community of interest with ourselves, there must always remain a race of troublesome marauders. And that feeling this, we should try to make them a part of ourselves with a common faith and common interest, um, useful servants, consumers of our goods, contributors to our revenue, in short, a source of strength and wealth for this colony, such as Providence designed them to be. If you listen to our first episode, this kind of language is pretty familiar. As Vincent O'Malley put it, Gray's self-appointed mission was to convert indigenous people into brown Europeans, destroying their culture and way of life in the process. His attitude was, Africans are just as good in every way as Europeans. They have the same humanity, the same potential, but they are trapped in a dead-end culture. In that dead-end culture, there is nothing good, nothing praiseworthy. Therefore, we need to destroy their culture, root and branch, in order to allow the, 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 the human being to realize his or her full potential. George Gray and his supporters in the colonial office had convinced themselves that all this was in everyone's best interest. They thought of themselves as heroic humanitarians. In reality, they were racist cultural imperialists. Gray would use increasingly ruthless tactics towards this goal with increasingly devastating consequences. In South Africa, those consequences were felt most heavily by the Corsa. Remember, these were a people who'd been at war with the colonists for a generation, and with Gray's arrival, they were about to face a brand new challenge. His arrival coincided with the outbreak of a deadly cattle disease, uh, generally called lung sickness or bovine pleuropneumonia, which was a disease that had come over from, from Europe uh, and it's a, it's a very, very terrible disease. You know, they stop being able to breathe, they rot from the inside, they snort out their lungs through their nostrils. I mean, Africans had ways of uh, uh, dealing with cattle sicknesses, but not with a, with a, with a completely alien disease uh, like this. Um, and they, 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 they felt that there must be a, a, a reason for this. And uh, we come now to the episode in, in, in Kosa history, which used to be called the, the National Suicide. Before we go on, I just want to acknowledge that this is a painful chapter of Kosa history, and I'm coming to it as a complete outsider. And as Jeff Perez points out, many Kosa people don't consider what happens next to be a national suicide. They consider it a genocide, and they think the perpetrator was Governor George Grey. We'll come back to that in a moment. In 1854, the Corsa were reeling from the impact of this new cattle disease. They were also reeling from 70 years of war with the settlers. And in this chaotic time, a new religious belief took hold. It started with a young girl. This young girl, Nongase, was out in the field, scaring the birds away from the corn. And uh, she was approached by two strange men. And the two strange men gave their names. uh, And these were the names of people who had died long ago. And uh, the two strange men said, kill, kill your cattle, destroy, destroy your corn. Uh, 
they are sick because they have been reared by sinful hands. So go home, build yourselves new houses, dig yourself new granaries, throw away your clothes, your old clothes, dress yourself in new garments. God has seen your misery and will come and redeem you. Over the next two years, 400,000 cattle were slaughtered. Crops were burned en masse. The believers thought their ancestors would rise from the dead and drive the colonists into the sea. They'd bring new cattle and corn to feed the people. But when all this failed to happen, 40,000 Corsa starved to death. And today... A lot of Corsa think George Gray engineered this catastrophe from the very beginning, when those two strange men approached the prophetess of the cattle-killing movement. It's generally believed by a Corsa people that, that I've spoken to uh, that these two men were, were the agents uh, of, of uh, Sir George Gray. Uh, it, it's, it's even sometimes maintained that... Uh, they had microphones or tape recorders or you know all sorts of anachronistic beliefs. Africans really believe that Sir George Gray engineered the whole thing uh, to destroy the nation uh, using the, the young girl, Nongase, as, as a tool. The whole incident is viewed today as a source of embarrassment to Akosa people. It's a very, it's a very sensitive uh, um, issue not the sort of thing you would raise casually with a Kosa person. So did George Gray really manipulate this religious movement from the beginning? Frankly, I don't know. What's undisputed is that he seized on the cattle-killing crisis to push his own agenda. And in the process, he made everything worse. Instead of relaxing the pressure under which he's put the, the chiefs, he doubles down on the pressure. Instead of feeling sympathetic to those chiefs who have allowed themselves to be misled, uh, he blames them. He he concocts uh, uh, an amazing story that these people have starved themselves to death so that they will uh, fight more furiously against the the white people. He captures them. He sends them to uh, Robben Island. That, of course, is the same Robben Island where Nelson Mandela would be held prisoner for 18 years under the apartheid regime. Mandela himself was Corsa. And Gray didn't just use the cattle-killing movement to round up and imprison his political opponents. He also blocked colonists from giving food to starving Africans. The ordinary white citizens of King Williamstown, feeling very, very sorry for people starving to death, they uh, they start a sort of a, a soup kitchen. A- and then Gray says, no, 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 you can't do this. You're only encouraging them. And he prepares his own stocks of food, but you can only, if, if you're one of the, the, the refugees, you can only access this food when you sign a labor contract. And they, they, they sign the contract, they get the food, they get loaded onto wagons and taken off to arid parts of the country where they are but on contract as, as cheap labour. Gray probably felt like this was a win-win. The farmers get cheap workers, the Corsa get fed, and the two races build an economic relationship which helps assimilate the Corsa into British culture. But even if you buy into Gray's idea that destroying indigenous culture was a good thing... There are parts of the scheme which are impossible to justify. The idea that the people had was that although some of them would go away and work in order to earn subsistence, they would leave a relative or two behind just to keep the place for them so that when they'd earned enough money to rehabilitate themselves, they could come back to the places where they were born. Uh, and Gray then and his, his underlings in King Williamstown then, as it were, force these people uh, off the land in order to to make space for a white colonisation. So he he considerably aggravated the situation 
So basically, some of the healthier Corsa are sent off to earn food. Then, while they're gone, Grey claims the Corsa chiefs are scheming against him and seizes their land for white settlers. Grey always had a ruthless, authoritarian streak, but that streak seems to grow wider in his years as the governor of Cape Colony. Historian and author Edmund Bowen thinks that's partly down to problems in Grey's personal life. Over the last decade, his marriage to Eliza had been falling apart. She felt increasingly that she was being ignored because he was so busy. You know, when they arrived in New Zealand, uh, the first thing he did was rush up to Northland and, and leaving her in a very uncomfortable government house that she hated and all her best friends were still in Adelaide and their marriage really sort of went from bad to worse. On top of this, Grey lost his supporters in the British government. In the 1857 election, the Conservative faction ousted the Liberals. The Conservatives weren't big fans of George Grey. They eventually recalled him as governor in 1859. That was a huge blow to Grey's pride. He was never much good at taking criticism. He was still simmering when his ship arrived in the UK and a journalist from the Times newspaper came on board to interview him. But that reporter had some surprising news. While he'd been en route, the Conservative government had fallen and Grey had been reinstated as governor. It was a moment of reprieve, but it didn't last. After a short holiday in England, George and Eliza boarded a Royal Navy steamer to take them back to South Africa via Brazil, HMS Forte, flagship of Vice Admiral Henry Keppel. The Forte was three days out from Rio, and Grey was strolling through the ship's corridors. He turned a corner and stopped in surprise. In front of him, was his wife, Eliza, hunched down near the floor. She was right in the moment of pushing a piece of paper under the door of a cabin. Grey stormed up and ripped the note out of her hand. It read, You must clear the door, dearest, and leave me to come when I think it's safe. There was a second note in Eliza's other hand. This one read, I hope and expect to see my own darling. I am too deaf to hear. No, I don't get what that means either, but Grey must have put two and two together. He stared at Eliza in shock, then looked at the door she'd been pushing that note underneath. His wife had been swapping love notes with Vice Admiral Henry Keppel. And um, lost his temper and his head completely. You know, it was a complete emotional explosion. Grey raged at Keppel, Eliza and the ship's captain for two hours straight. Keppel later wrote that... Under extreme pressure from Captain Turnout and the surgeon, who stated that the governor would either commit suicide or murder his wife, I consented to return to Rio. When they arrived back in Brazil, Grey ordered Eliza home to the UK. It was the last time he would see her for 37 years. In the meantime, he wrote to anyone who would listen, demonising Keppel and Eliza as adulterers. Keppel was horrified. He wrote to Eliza saying, The injury my unfortunate feelings have already led you into is too painful to bear. And the heartbreaking part is that any attempt on my part to help you may make matters worse. The affair between Eliza Gray and Henry Keppel became a massive public scandal, and it was mostly thanks to George Gray himself. Marital affairs were probably just as common in 19th century Britain as they are today, but when they did happen, they were kept quiet. <laughs> 
and George Grey did not follow this rule of Victorian high society. He wrote about it to people, and as everyone said, um, if he hadn't, it would have gone away, in that it wouldn't have become a, the scandal that it did. By the time Gray arrived in Cape Colony, he was convinced everyone was talking and laughing at him behind his back. On top of that, he was suffering physically. His old spear wound was causing problems, and to deal with the pain, he took opiate drugs. Edmund Bowen thinks he was probably addicted. There's a collapse physically and mentally uh, for him there. He, he, he was just worked almost to death. I mean, nowadays politicians fly about, you know, when there isn't COVID. There are trains and all the rest of it. But, for example, when the young Prince Alfred, the Duke of Edinburgh, stayed with him, he was about 14 or 15 year old, they rode a thousand miles on horseback in a month. I mean, that's a physical feat across the high veldt and, and all the rest of it. Gray absolutely exhausts himself mentally and physically. And the whole time he seems to be sort of almost dreaming of going back to New Zealand. Oh, yes. Yeah. He never lost track. You know, he was writing to his New Zealand friends and he he loved the country. He loved the New Zealand bush and the mountains and the lakes and so on. And he kept thinking about the, these in South Africa. 1860 was probably the worst year of George Gray's life thus far. But there was a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. In June 1861, he was offered a chance to return to his old job as Governor of New Zealand, to leave his troubled years in South Africa behind him. But in a lot of ways, it was out of the frying pan and into the fire. New Zealand was in crisis. The Pākehā population had risen astronomically. By 1858, they outnumbered Māori for the first time in our history. Both the ordinary settlers and a cabal of rich speculators were constantly pressuring the new colonial parliament to get more land from Māori. A war had broken out in Taranaki after the government tried to seize the Waitara block without the permission of its rightful owners. Partly in response to that pressure over land, Waikato Māori threw their support behind the Kingitanga, the Māori King movement. This movement had begun even before Grey left New Zealand in the 1850s. Here's Waikato Tainui historian Rahui Papa. It was around about 1845, or not so long after the signing of the Tiriti of Waitangi, uh, that um, um, Tamihana Te Paraha uh, and Pirikawau uh, went to England and they saw the mana uh, of the Queen and they saw uh, an organised uh, type of mana motuhake. And so they desired that for New Zealand. So they brought the idea home because Māori were very feudal at that time and iwi uh, reigned uh, in their own regions. And the Ariki and the Rangatira of those regions uh, had full autonomy over, uh, over everything. So the Kingitanga was a movement with deep roots, but support had been growing through the 1850s as it became clear the colonists were not going to honour the Treaty of Waitangi. Finally, in 1858, Gray's old friend and ally, Pō Tato Te Whiro Whiro, paramount Rangatira of Waikato, was crowned as the first Māori king. The idea was for the king to be able to interface directly with the queen because they felt that that's where the, the treaty relationship resided on a mana to mana uh, type of level. With God as the ridge pole and the Maori king on one, the rafters on one side and the, and the Pākehā queen uh, with the rafters on the other side, it was supposed to be a harmonious relationship. It wasn't designed to be an uh, adversarial relationship between Maori. Uh, and Victoria. But the Pākehā settlers saw things differently. They were frustrated at the Kingitanga's opposition to land sales, and at least some misunderstood the movement as a challenge to the authority of Queen Victoria. The former governor, Gore Brown, had been furious when some supporters of the Kingitanga went to fight against the Crown in the Taranaki War. He'd begun drawing up plans for an invasion of the Waikato. 
but there was still a chance for peace. Governor Gray was coming back to New Zealand, and he'd always been a friend to Waikato Māori. If anyone could steer this country away from war, surely it was him. There was a whole lot of hope. There was a hope that uh, Governor Gray would be his usual advocate self, uh, that he would be able to uh, show mana uh, in Aotearoa, uh, that he would be able to uh, rekindle some of those relationships uh, with the Māori uh, and with the chiefs uh, of that time. Um, Gore Brown uh, in the Taranaki conflict was looked on as a huge villain in the eyes of the majority of Māori uh, and so the coming, uh, the returning of uh, Grey uh, was uh, something that they actually celebrated. And why shouldn't Waikato Māori celebrate? Grey had been close friends and allies with Pōtato Te Whiro Whiro, the first Māori king. And while Te Whiro Whiro had died the year before Grey arrived back in New Zealand, his son, Matutaira Tāwhiao, the next king, was also someone Grey knew well. Kingi Tafiao had actually lived with Grey for a few months as a teenager back in the mid-1850s. But historian Vincent O'Malley says Kingi Tanga were putting their hope in a version of George Grey who no longer really existed. He is a very different person, I think, in 1861, and... You know, I th- another historian, I think Alan Ward, argued that Gray was not the best but the worst possible uh, person to send to New Zealand as governor in 1861 because he arrived with a set of preconceived notions about what needed to happen. They were all based on the New Zealand that he saw during his first governorship. Things had changed dramatically by 1861. You had a settler parliament in place, you had the King Tonga, the Māori King movement, you had these enormous tensions across the country, and Gray's old flour and sugar policies from the 1840s weren't going to cut it anymore. Uh, that you know things had had changed so dramatically, and he wasn't prepared for that situation. I mean, is a big part of the problem from his perspective that he now actually has to deal with people who are on reasonably even footing to himself in terms of sort of being a massive power in New Zealand. I mean, on one hand you've got the settler parliament, and on the other hand you've got the Kingitanga movement. Yeah, I mean, uh, Gray is an autocrat. He's not prepared to share power with anybody, Māori or Pākehā, really. And, you know, he fall, he's constantly falling out with colonial ministries about policies. Um, and the Kingitanga is, is something completely new from his first governorship. And, you know, when he arrives, the question that everybody is asking him, themselves, uh, is Gray prepared to tolerate the King movement? Vincent O'Malley says there's evidence Gray was planning to attack Kingitanga from the moment he arrived back in Aotearoa. Gray arrives in the country in September 1861, and for a week he has to share government house in Auckland with the outgoing governor, Thomas Gore Brown. And he tells uh, Brown during that week that he he means to take the Waikato, and, and Brown later recalls this, and, and his wife Harriet Brown also notes that. You know, is this just a, a you know an act of bravado, or is this his real intention? What we do know is he doesn't do anything to reassure King Tanga leaders. Instead, Gray exacerbated the tension. He alienated and offended members of King Tanga when he first met them at Topiri. He built the Great South Road from Auckland into Waikato and refused to listen when King Tanga raised concern that this road could be used for a military invasion. He tried to set up rival Māori political groups to undermine the king's mana. And at every step, he sent letters to the colonial office in London. He didn't mention anything about his own wishes to invade Waikato. Instead, he claimed Kingitanga was planning to attack him. You know, Gray assembles this, what, I, what I'd really refer to as his dodgy dossier of evidence to, to justify his invasion, to make it look like a, an unavoidable war. But... As historians have been saying for the last fifty or sixty years, once once you once you look at that evidence closely, it falls away. There's there's nothing there. He's attempting to to justify the unjustifiable, really. On July twelfth, eighteen sixty three, Sir George Grey crossed the Rubicon. His troops marched across the Mangatafiti stream, the border of Kingitanga territory, 
What followed was the Waikato War, the largest, most significant conflict between Māori and Pākehā in the history of Aotearoa. We could spend a whole other podcast talking about every twist and turn of this war. In fact, we have. It's called Stories of Tainui. It's part of our New Zealand War series. There's a link in the description for this show and on our website. In brief, the war's a disaster. Hundreds are killed and injured, including Māori non-combatants, shot and burned to death in the peaceful village of Rangiaufia. And George Grey missed every opportunity to end this conflict quickly. I mean, the the first major battle of the Waikato War, Rangiriri, November 1863. After that battle, um, Kingitanga leaders um, plead with the Crown to come and make peace. And Grey sends word and says that he will he will do so only provided um, the Kingitanga abandons Narua Wahia, which is kind of the unofficial capital. They take down the King's flag from there and allow the Union Jack to fly. And so those are, you know, those are quite strong demands to make, really. Uh, but they're complied with in full. But Grey never comes to make peace. It doesn't happen. And I think there are probably a couple of reasons for that. Uh, I think for Grey, probably he assessed that the Kingitanga, whilst it had been damaged, had not been destroyed by this time. It's, it, it was still a powerful movement. And he hadn't gone to war to teach the Kingitanga a lesson. He went to to war to eliminate it as any kind of rival um, centre of authority to the Crown, and he hadn't achieved that by that time. The other factor is that colonial ministers, of course, have their eyes on the very rich land south of the Narawa here, so there there are these various factors at play in the extension of that war, none of them um, related to the Kingitanga's desire to fight on. Throughout the war, they're begging the Crown to, to, to come and talk peace with them. As Vincent mentioned, Grey was under a lot of pressure from a pro-war faction of the settler parliament. It was led by the war minister, Thomas Russell, and the premier, Frederick Whitaker, both of whom ended up making massive profits buying and selling confiscated Waikato land. We've talked about these two in a previous episode of Black Sheep. At one point, Whitaker and Russell convinced the entire cabinet to resign in a successful effort to force Grey to confiscate more Māori land. Edmund Bowen says it's almost like Grey's fighting two wars, a physical war with the Kingitanga and a political war with the settler parliament. He was now faced with a settler government run by men he didn't like. This very independent-minded colonial parliament had got fed up with governors. So (laughs) he's in another state of war. He took any defeat or rebuff very badly. Uh, And I put this down to the increasing fragility of his psychological uh, setup. And he was shattered physically and mentally. And Gray didn't just fight with the politicians. He also fell out with General Duncan Cameron, the guy leading his invasion of Waikato. One settler politician wrote this about Gray's relationship with Cameron. He seemed to take real pleasure in dragging the general off the road to see some huge cowry tree or visit a burying place in a mangrove swamp that could not be found. Gray nearly drowned Cameron in the mud. I thought he did it on purpose. Gray and Cameron start out um, on quite good terms, but they, they quite quickly fall out. And by the end of the Waikato War, Cameron basically says, that's it, no more. We're not advancing further south. Like many of his men, he asks, you know, why are we doing the dirty work for settlers in New Zealand? Why aren't they fighting this war themselves? So they do have a major falling out. And by 1865, it becomes very, very bitter and, and accusations are traded back and forth between them. I mean, there's stuff like, you know, publishing each other's private letters and, you know, demeaning each other and dispatches back to the colonial office. Like, it almost seems very petty. It becomes a very unedifying um, spectacle, yes. And as news of these feuds and the mounting losses reached London, Grey lost his golden reputation with the colonial office. A turning point came when the British were dealt a heavy defeat at the Battle of Gate Park. 
in April 1864. When he heard about that disaster, the colonial secretary, Henry Cardwell, sent Gray a furious letter. 10,000 English troops had been placed at your disposal for objects of great imperial concern and not for the attainment of any merely local object. You will not continue the expenditure of blood and treasure longer than is absolutely necessary for the establishment of a just and enduring peace. But Gray did not follow those instructions. From his point of view, the colonial office were hopelessly out of touch, trying to micromanage his governorship from the other side of the world. He was equally annoyed with the pro-war faction of the settler parliament, which was constantly accusing him of being overly generous to Māori. Not to mention, he had to keep his Māori allies on side too. Here's a letter he wrote to a friend in 1864. I am in constant conflict with one side or the other. You cannot conceive how difficult it is to preserve your temper and to keep your judgment cool under such circumstances. Gray didn't exactly succeed in preserving his temper or keeping his judgment cool. He often flew into rages or locked himself up at home and refused to speak to anyone for days on end. He also kept launching new wars against Māori. After the fighting in Waikato ended, he ordered General Cameron to crack down on Taranaki Māori, who had adopted the new Paimārire religion. This faith started off as a religion of pacifism, which blended aspects of Christianity with older Māori traditions. You can imagine Gray's reaction. He wanted Māori to abandon their culture and assimilate into his own. Paimārire was a clear rejection of that. Gray and many other colonists came to see the faith as explicitly anti-Pākehā, especially after some Paimārere followers killed a number of British soldiers and executed a missionary who was accused of acting as a spy for Gray. But General Cameron was not on board with Gray's crusade against Paimārere. He saw it as just another colonial land grab. Cameron signed a letter of resignation, and while he was waiting for a replacement, he kept his army well away from Pai Marire strongholds. The pro-war politicians were disgusted and Gray was furious, but he saw one final chance to rescue his reputation. He stormed up from Wellington to take command of the army from Cameron, and personally led an assault on a pa called Wereroa. At Wereroa, uh, Gray supposedly personally leads a group of colonial troops and Māori allies into the pa, but the pa again is essentially empty. Uh, but he talks this up as a great success, um, and really he uses this incident to denigrate his rival, um, to denigrate Cameron and to talk up his own greatness, really. And this is, you know, the taking of Wereroa is, is framed as this glorious, glorious victory for Crown forces. Gray's supposed success at Wereroa was enough to get the politicians in New Zealand and Britain off his back for a few more years. But as the New Zealand wars dragged into a brutal guerrilla conflict, his reputation with the colonial office dropped lower and lower, and the debts kept climbing higher and higher. The Waikato War alone had cost £750,000, and the Bank of New Zealand was refusing to offer the colonial government any more loans. Gray argued taxpayers in Britain should foot the bill instead, and for the colonial office, that was the final straw. Edmund Bowen. The British government policy didn't matter which party was in power or which personalities... Um, they were determined that the British taxpayer should not pay the costs engendered by the settlement colonies. So Canada, the Australian colonies, South Africa and New Zealand uh, were basically told that they had to look after their own affairs, they had to pay for their own affairs, and that was not the responsibility of the British taxpayer. Gray and the colonial politicians hated this policy. 
There were even suggestions that New Zealand should join up with Australia and become an independent republic. But the colonial office had had enough. In February 1868, Gray received a dispatch from the colonial secretary, which ended with this short note. I shall soon be able to inform you of the appointment of your successor in the government of New Zealand, and of the time at which she may be expected to arrive in the colony. George Grey had been sacked. You've got to imagine a lot of Māori were happy to see the back of him, but the Pākehā colonists were furious. By this point, Grey was their hero, the guy who defended them both from so-called rebel Māori and an uncaring British colonial office. At a public meeting in Nelson, the Speaker of the House, Sir David Munro, gave a 3,000-word speech praising Grey and demonising the British colonial authorities. After six years of arduous service, in this most trying position, beset with difficulties and complications, thwarted often by those from whom we might have expected the most willing help, sparing neither mind nor body, venturing among the natives even at the risk of his life in hopes of persuading them to be peaceful subjects, we find this governor dismissed by the home authorities with a curt intimation that his services were no longer required and that he should be informed by the next mail who his successor was to be. A man treated in this way may well feel discouraged and sick at heart. And if it is our opinion that he has been shabbily and unjustly treated, it is our duty to say so. Gray claimed he was looking forward to retirement. Maybe he was, or maybe he realised that he'd make a much better martyr if he let other people speak in his defence. In any case, he returned to England after a few years and attempted to make a new career as a politician. That attempt wasn't very successful. While he was gone, the New Zealand wars raged on. Māori leaders like Te Koti and Te Tokawaru led brilliant guerrilla campaigns against colonial forces. But eventually, their resistance was ground down. Grey returned to New Zealand in 1870, in the dying days of those conflicts. He settled down for retirement at a mansion on his own private island in the Hauraki Gulf. We actually haven't mentioned this private island yet. Um, Gray had bought Kawo Island in 1862, and it was pretty much his favourite place on earth. Here's biographer Edmund Bowen again. He established his own little estate there and developed a menagerie of the most amazing variety of animals, including monkeys and so on so many eventually that he and his guests had to go and shoot them. From the 1870s and on in particular, it became a very, very popular tourist spot and Grey would walk about and, and, uh, and mix with everyone and talk at inordinate length on the beauties of the island and uh, about anything else that anybody anybody wanted to talk about. Kawo Island was a totally bizarre place. George Grey was an obsessive collector. Like, I've got a list here of the animals he imported to Kawo. Peacocks, pheasants, emu, turkeys, kookaburra, wild hogs, elk, the cape sheep, antelope, kangaroos, possums, wallabies, zebra... He planted all kinds of trees, natives and exotics. A lot of them are still growing on the island today. And inside his mansion was his massive personal library and collection of Māori, Aboriginal and African artefacts. (laughs) 
So Grey settled down to become the slightly eccentric lord of his own little island kingdom. It feels like we're ready to roll credits on George Grey's life story, but actually there's one final chapter. In the mid-1870s, something happened. Up till this point, Aotearoa was mostly governed by provincial councils. It was sort of like the United States of New Zealand. Now there was a proposal to remove those councils. This set off the biggest political crisis uh, of the next 20 years. So there were two sides to this fight. The provincialists, who wanted to keep the old system, and the centralists, who wanted to centralise power within a single national government. George Grey was a hardcore provincialist. After all, he had created the provincial councils back in his first governorship in the 1850s. Grey suddenly wakes up on Carwell and announces that he's going to return to public life to defend his constitution and that the provincial system is the most perfect system that can ever be invented by man and that is the epitome of freedom. This launches possibly the most bitter political row we've ever had in our history. It's incredibly bitter. Like, uh, reading the the quotes back and forth, I mean, you know, Grey talking about dragging his enemies behind his chariot yeah. like slaves. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah, like, that, that wonderful. Like, yeah. the, the, like, you'd think that we were arguing over something that was absolutely life and death. They didn't have the same laws of libel and all the rest of it that we have today. And so public life was rougher and harder and ruthless. Gray ultimately lost his battle against centralisation. But he seemed to thrive on the political brawling, and it didn't take him long to find another cause to fight for. Gray, although he had an inherited fortune, and he was a rich man at this time, uh, he didn't believe in the, cap- in the capitalist philosophies. He wanted everyone to be able to own their own property and have their own farms, no matter what race they were. Now, the only thing was, you see, the typical of Gray, any idea he had like that, he assumed that he'd invented it. And so his liberalism was true liberalism and anyone who opposed him in any way at all in politics was clearly a reactionary and that of course was nonsense there was just about a total universal acceptance in the political world by all the major politicians for liberal reforms his opponents They all had the same ideas. But that didn't lessen the sheer viciousness of political life during the the, the 1870s. Gray managed to fight his way to the top of the New Zealand government. He became Premier in 1877, the equivalent of Prime Minister, Vincent O'Malley. There are hopes at this time that, amongst other things, this might result in the return of the confiscated lands, because Gray, after all, had had said that he'd always been opposed to this policy. And Gray Wimani Apoto personally invests a lot in that, and he forms this kind of alliance with Gray in a way. Rewi Mani Apoto was a famous war leader in the Kingitanga movement. It might seem odd that he'd end up forging a friendship with his old enemy less than two decades after the Waikato War had ended, Rahui Papa says it made sense from a Māori perspective, especially after Grey agreed there would be no further invasion and that Kingitanga land could be governed autonomously. And I think 
the agreement around Te Rohe Pōtai or uh, a nation within a nation. Um, uh, and that notion of the nation within a nation uh, gave Rewi uh, the reassurance to be able to um, fully commit to a friendship with Gray uh, and for Gray to show uh, that uh, he was uh, a man of his word. And if you look into a more Māori uh, psyche, after a battle, they would find ways to hoho te rongo, to bring peace amongst the tribes. And, and I suppose uh, him uh, befriending, or and vice versa, and Grey uh, befriending um, Rewi, that those um, uh, things had come about and a more peaceful situation had been developed between them. But while Grey did help ease tensions with Kingitanga, his efforts to return confiscated land failed. Gray is ultimately not able to deliver on that. When you look at the um, the details of what he was prepared to return or in a position to return, it seems like he was offering back about 20,000 acres of land in the Waikato out of 1.2 million acres of land confiscated. Now that was something that the Kingitanga could never accept. So nothing comes of that. His brief two-year term as, as Premier kind of again ends in failure, really. As always, Gray was an authoritarian. He made great speeches about the need for progressive reform, but he couldn't build the coalitions he needed to make that reform actually happen. Like, another reason these plans failed was that some Māori MPs opposed efforts to return lands to rival iwi. During his two-year stint as Premier, he also tried and failed to broaden voting rights, including voting rights for women. But in the end his government collapsed into infighting, a lot of it triggered by George Grey himself. But while Grey's combative style of politics was bad for getting stuff done, it was good for winning him votes. In fact, in the 1879 election, he campaigned for two seats and briefly became the MP for both Thames and Christchurch City. I mean, he was clearly an absolutely mesmerising public speaker. He invented the idea of the stump tour and he went absolutely everywhere from Auckland to Invercargill and to all the smaller places as well. This new style of political campaigning heavily influenced a future generation of New Zealand political leaders. He becomes the elder statesman And it doesn't matter that he gets up in Parliament and makes an absolute fool of himself very often and becomes a laughing stock with a lot of the other members. He's surrounded by this little group of disciples. One of those disciples was Richard Seddon, who went on to become one of our most famous Prime Ministers. Gray slowly faded into old age. One of his final political acts was to participate in a conference that proposed uniting New Zealand and Australia as one country. He was actually pretty instrumental in making sure that New Zealand didn't become another Australian state. In 1894, he retired from politics for good and went home to England. Some well-meaning relatives reunited him with his wife, Eliza. It was the first time the couple had seen each other since Grey caught her slipping that note under Vice Admiral Keppel's door 37 years earlier. The couple lived together for their final few years, but they never reconciled. They both suffered dementia and fought pretty much constantly. They died within a month of each other in September 1898. News of George Gray's death brought tributes from across the empire, particularly from New Zealand, where he'd become an almost mythical figure. His old disciple, Richard Seddon, erected a massive statue of him in the middle of Albert Park in Auckland. And there's this kind of view of him as good Governor Gray. And I think that that kind of perception of Gray as this this very humane, this this... this enlightened, civilised man, this man of letters, is one that 
generations of New Zealand school children have ingrained in them. Um, you know, when I came to write about Gray and his role in the invasion of Waikato, people who read my book said, I, I never realised this about Gray. I, I was always taught that he was a good guy. It's impossible to ever know what was going on inside George Gray's mind. Did he ever really believe he was acting in the best interests of Indigenous people? Or was he just using that as an excuse to cover a simple desire for power? Honestly, I don't know the answer to that question. But you also have to ask yourself, how much should we care about his intentions? The impact of his actions speak for themselves. It's not just the wars he launched, it's what those wars enabled. Right at the same time George Grey was earning his reputation as a die-hard progressive politician, Māori were being forced to the fringes of New Zealand society. The Native Land Court was sweeping massive amounts of Māori land into Pākehā hands. The Native school system was doing its best to stamp out Māori language and culture. Poverty and disease were devastating Māori communities. By the time Grey died, in the 1890s, the Māori population had collapsed to its lowest point in history. Around 42,000 people. Less than half the pre-1840 population. Did George Grey intend this to happen? Maybe not. Was he the only one responsible? Maybe not. George Grey dreamed of becoming a hero, and for a long time that's how he was celebrated. But his legacy is anything but heroic. Thanks for listening. Very special thanks to our guests, Rahui Papa, Edmund Bowen, Vincent O'Malley and Jeff Perez. Edmund Bowen's book is To Be a Hero, a biography of Sir George Grey, and Vincent O'Malley's book is The Great War for New Zealand. Go read both of those for a hell of a lot more background on Sir George Grey and all the events he triggered and surrounded him. And for more Black Sheep, make sure to follow us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever other app you use. Also, go check out RNZ's other excellent podcasts. We actually just said farewell this week to Alison Balance, our long-term colleague at RNZ, who you probably know hosts uh, the Our Changing World Science program. We worked out at her sort of leaving ceremony that she'd done more than a thousand different stories for Our Changing World and for her other projects like um, Voice of the Iceberg, Voice of the Cody, Voice of the Kakapo and uh, Elemental. So go back into RNZ's archives and find her stuff because she's just an amazing storyteller and we're much the poorer for having lost her. But don't stop listening to Our Changing World because we have a new excellent producer, Claire Kincannon, who's coming on board very shortly. He'll be in your ears with more science stories from New Zealand. Black Sheep is written and produced by me, William Ray. The executive producer is Tim Watkin, and our sound engineer is William Saunders. Our voice actors are Nathan Mudge, Simon Dickinson, Sonia Yee, Duncan Smith, and Adam McCauley. When you're ready to pop the question, the last thing you want to do is second-guess the ring. At BlueNile.com, you can find the perfect ring for her with guidance from Blue Nile's jewelry experts who are on hand 24-7 and the ease and convenience of shopping online. For a limited time, BlueNile.com is offering 36-month special financing on minimum purchases of $1,000. Restrictions apply. See BlueNile.com for details. That's BlueNile.com. BlueNile.com.